Now, of course, uh, many may know Hayden, Hayden Washington, uh, from his work, but I will note that he is an environmental scientist, uh, ad adjunct lecturer in Pangaea Center for Biological and Environmental Sciences in New South Wales University. Uh, he has 40 years or over 40 years experience um, uh, in as a, a, a conservation activist and has tirelessly worked in this area. He also worked in the CSIRO and was a director for sustainability in local government. So he's seen on the ground what can be done, what local councils can do, and he's helped them change. And a lot of that was very, very useful. He's written a number of books, uh, Sense of Wonder, The Wilderness Not, Climate Change Denial. And you'll see, I believe, in his talk, uh, many of those books. And of course, uh, you can find out for yourself. As I mentioned earlier, he was instrumental, very largely instrumental in getting the uh, Fenner Conference to run in uh, New South Wales University in 2014. And I remember, as I was there, uh, the background interest in the question, what can we do? What can we do? How can we change things? And uh, a book came out of that called Addicted to Growth, and a subsequent book that Cassie New South Wales produced called Positive Steps Toward a Steady State Economy, which, of course, just a little plug, are available on our Cassie New South Wales website. Anyway, now I'll hand over to Hayden, and uh, um, uh, I um, expect a, a, an interesting presentation. Uh, well, thanks, thanks, Matt. I'll, I'll certainly, uh, certainly try. Um, I, I notice I'm not coming up on the screen. I don't for me. Uh, I uh, hope can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, well, let's hope it's, uh, uh, I'll come up, but uh, yeah, okay. I'm um, an environmental scientist, but uh, I've been writing for the last few years um, about and just sharing, uh, and I'm not gonna maximize it because there's this problem with Zoom that if you maximize PowerPoints, it doesn't advance the slides, which is uh, uh, a worry. So. My talk's called Environmental Science Looks at Neoclassical Economics in Bemusement. And there's a wonderful cartoon by Pollock about the CEO School of Economics, where the question is to explain in your own words how limitless growth can be sustained on a planet with limited resources and give examples and show your reasoning. Uh, why bemusement? Well, bemusement has the idea of great puzzlement, but also uh, an aspect of amusement. And uh, I think we do need a bit of humor when we're considering the coiled and difficult knot of neoclassical economics. Uh, now. <laughs> now, having said that it's, uh, did that, that didn't, oh, there we are, thank you. Uh, as we did advance for everyone. We're now, can, you can now see the books that are on the screen. Yeah, I can see them. Yes. Okay. Just, just checking because the problem yes, yes. has like, got them. Yeah, it's sort of largely based on uh, a number of books I've written over the years. So in the last few years, I've been writing uh, quite a lot about ecological economics as well as ecological ethics. I hope Scott Morrison's read them all. <laughs> if, if only, if only. Uh, he'd probably throw them across the room. But um, so I'm peering in at neoclassical economics, but I'm going back to basics. There's going to be a lot of discussion about more specific strategies uh, by other speakers. But I'm, as an environmental scientist, looking at neoclassical economics and marveling how unrelated it is to reality, sustainability, and ethics. And as um, Einstein noted, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, but that's where we are because neoclassical economics is wearing blinkers of staggering size, as we shall see. So some of you may remember The Magic Pudding by Norman Lindsay, came out in 1918 about a pudding that could never be consumed. Now, it's a good children's story, but I'd suggest it's a terrible way to run an economy if we want to live sustainably on earth. So I'm going to go take a step back and to consider society's predicament, particularly in regard to the world we live in. 
finitude. As Kenneth Balding noted in the 60s, anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. So, and in fact, if you Google that, you'll find David Attenborough has repeated it recently. So there are ecological limits and they have been exceeded. Well, limits to growth came out in 1972, uh, basically saying that there were limits to growth and was very strongly attacked by neoclassical economists. So were they right to suggest there were limits to growth or not? Well, let's just have a quick look. I'm not gonna read all this out at the environmental science uh, in 20th century, population up fourfold, industrial pollution 40-fold, energy use 16-fold, uh, fish catches 35-fold, et cetera, et cetera. And we've lost large chunks of uh, coral reefs, mangroves, and wetlands. And of course, that was just the 20th century. The situation is worse now. So where are this led? Well, the ecological footprint, the world ecological footprint is now 1.75 Earths. We only have one Earth. Living planet index has declined by 68% since 1970. So species extinction is at least a thousand times above the normal level in the fossil record. Uh, majority of ecosystem servers are degrading and we're past four of nine planetary boundaries, at least, possibly more. Some we're not sure of the data. So Witzman and Rockstrom noted in their book, Bankrupting Nature, that we're bankrupting nature and consuming the past, present, and future of our biosphere. So why? Well, growth mania is the term that uh, Herman Daly coined in the 70s, and the great writer Edward Abbey has noted that growth for growth's sake is the ideology of a cancer cell. Now, of course, in nature, nothing except entropy grows forever, uh, but neoclassical economics has got itself into really quite a bizarre situation. It argues the economy can grow forever. In fact, it insists it must. Hence, on a finite planet, we have the result, an accelerating environmental crisis. Now, uh, the great Herman Daly noted that the verb to grow has been twisted. The original notion included growth to maturity or sufficiency. So that thus growth gives way to maturity or what could be called a steady state. So I argue we're in a death spiral. Uh, We've had a huge amount of environmental damage as we've exceeded ecological limits, but neoclassical economics only see growth as the cure for everything. So they argue for more growth, we have more environmental damage, they argue for more growth, and therefore we're in a death spiral where things are rapidly getting worse. So in nature, and there's another great cartoon by Pollock, uh, if there's a burst in growth, it's followed either by leveling off or by collapse and crash. So which one do we want as a society? Now, though some of you may remember Wiley e. Coyote, who kept doing uh, various stupid things. So uh, in a book I wrote in 2015, I argued that society tends to believe in seven stupid things. One, that the world's about us. Two, that we, although we live on a finite planet, growth is apparently praiseworthy. Um, population growth is not a problem and the more is better. Endless growth in consumption resources is not a problem. In fact, Julian Simon, the neoclassical economist, said that resource limits are only in our minds, that the invisible hand of the market and is a god, that technology can solve everything, technocentrism, and that greed is good. So let's look more closely at the assumptions of neoclassical economics, which I pulled together in 2014 uh, in my little book, Addicted to Growth largely from the writings of Herman Daly. One, of course, it's strong anthropocentrism. Nature's just a resource, has no moral standing. The idea of the invisible hand, you're probably all aware of. The idea of the economy can grow forever, and remember it went up 25-fold in the last century. The refusal to accept biophysical limits, a circular theory of production causing consumption, causing production that doesn't, in fact, mimic real life. Uh, ignores the second law of thermodynamics, the idea that environmental damage is just an externality of peripheral importance only, and the idea that all capital can be substituted. So human capital can be substituted for natural capital, as can money. So in other words, this is what's been called weak sustainability, 
the idea that we can replace the ecosystem services that actually support society with money. Um, now, these are variously unsustainable and irrational assumptions, uh, or and also unethical, but they continue to dominate uh, economics and modern society today, which is why we need a change. Now, one analyst, Brown, asked how it was possible for civilizations to be blind toward the grave approaching threats to their security, even when available evidence is accumulating about these threats. It's a really good question. Uh, then we, we have to realize if we actually want to look at reality, then the assumptions of neoclassical economics can rightly be called insane, because we're still proceeding to doing the same thing, which has been driving the mess that we are in. We're de denying reality through those assumptions. And of course, denial is something I've also written about a fair bit, and it's a key problem of humanity. Now, Stanley Cohen in the book States of Denial actually referred to three types of denial. The, the literal denial, which is basically, no, it's not happening. Uh, the interpretive denial, which is really spin, like remember collateral damage instead of killing civilians. We're seeing huge amounts of spin, of course, from Putin at the present time in terms of Ukraine. And the very common implicatory denial, the very common in we the people. So problems such as climate change aren't actually denied as such but we fail to transform them into social action. And that's a real problem. If, you, if, you can if we know the information, we accept it's true, but we choose to ignore it in terms of our actions. And that's a, a real problem in terms of turning things around in terms of neoclassical economics. But can we roll back denial? Yes, we can. While there's a trend in society towards denial, there is also a balancing trend to reveal the denial. And the key step is talk about reality, that endless growth on a finite planet is unsustainable. So dialogue is the enemy of denial. We have to talk about this, and I'm glad to see in the last few years, we are talking about this a lot more. So we may be in a time of change, I certainly hope so. Ecological economics, I believe, is uh, a light <laughs> on this. Um, it was originally defined as economics that acknowledges ecological limits, and uh, steady state economy we came through in 1977. Uh, and I believe, as I'll talk about later, that it's the most comprehensive answer to neoclassical economics. However, recently there's been more focus on degrowth. There's been eight international conferences and on the donut economics of Kate Raworth. I'll talk about these later as well. So I think we should ask what economic sustainability should mean. It's got to be, economy has to be a servant of society, not its master. So we've got that wrong in the last few decades. It can no longer be based on a denial of reality, physical laws and ecological limits. It mustn't be based on endless growth, but must bring both population and artifacts to ecologically sustainable levels. It should be based on sustainable well-being of society and nature. And uh, in fact, I was involved with a discussion in Griffith University a few days ago, where, which is about the well-being economy. And the interesting thing is in a lot of discussion of that well-being is in the academia is limited to only to humanity. Now, Victor, uh, Peter Victor in his uh, book on managing without growth has his low growth modeling, which basically suggests that we can do this. However, there is a confusion in ecological economics that I want to bring to the fore between the original idea that it must operate with ecological limits, uh, but that's not always <coughs> the case today. So Clive Spass, the eminent ecological economist, noted that uh, ecological economics has had an encompassing pluralism since the beginning, which has led to a resulting incoherence and brushing over of fundamental conflicts between different worldviews and the need to question the validity of those views in light of reality. So I, I believe there is a problem with pluralism. Uh, Pluralisms, you know, exist in different type of people with different views in the same society. Yeah, great, I'm all about dialogue. And, uh, but does that mean a field of study such as ecological economics should not, should not have a coherent focus or vision? I believe it needs one. 
Uh, and the same thing, sustainability art really has a problem with that. So if something means all things to all people, it really ceases to have a coherent meaning. So if, if ecological economics is operating within ecological limits, then should not theories and models that ignore this side of it be refuted? And I think that's a question which is still in play. Uh, so what is or is not ecological economics? Well, steady state economy is very old, 1977. It's about having sustainable population, low resource use and greater equity. So clearly it was designed to operate within ecological limits. Degrowth is trying to reduce uh, to ecolo ecologically sustainable limits. And originally the first conference stated it should degrow to a steady state economy. A lot of authors later have uh, not mentioned that. However, we're looking at UNEX, green economy, social ecological economics, supply of space, circular economy, sharing economy, the donut economy. Are these models truly within ecological economics? If not, what are they? Uh, so I've entered into discussion with this to do with uh, Joshua Farley, ecological economist, when uh, Michelle Maloney, who's speaking later, and I wrote a paper about ecological ethics in ecological economics. And he de described these models as models associated with ecological economics, rather than actual ecological economic models. But my point is the proof is in the, how people talk about it. And it's pretty clear that these are all talked about as actually being models in ecological economics. So meaning and definition are in fact central. Um, so we often say it's just semantics, but of course semantics actually meaning is critical. Um, given the rapidly worsening climate and environmental crises, I think ecological economics has to be very clear that it does mean operating within ecological limits. So if we ignore population and consumerism and consumption, then we're ignoring key drivers of ecological overshoot. And that's been really the keystone of environmental science since the beginning. So ecological economics must, in fact, uh, talk about an ecologically sustainable human population. And that's really hard for many in academia. At the moment, I've actually just started in the last couple of weeks working on another paper on population to try and get discussion of a very difficult issue uh, I've been involved with. Uh, three others, and in fact, uh, uh, it was very hard to get some of them published because there is a taboo about talking about population. So let's look at some of these models in ecological economics. Now, the top are five questions. Does it focus on population? Does it focus on reducing resources? Does it reduce consumerism and advertising? Does it focus on equity? And is it not an engine of more and more growth? So you can see that all of them reduce resources or aim to reduce resources. All of them focus on equity. Only two, and sometimes only one, in terms of the author actually have a central focus on population. Uh, only two really have a, a really clear focus on reducing consumerism. And uh, two of them are definitely see themselves as engines of new growth, the circular economy and green economy define themselves that way. Um, Kate Raworth has talked about in her book, I think she's changed a bit lately, of being growth agnostic. So there is in fact quite a big difference um, in terms of these models, in terms of where the focus is. And that raises what I would call partial solutions. There are good things in all these models of ecological economics, uh, which are worth doing, but some of them will not tackle very difficult issues that we do need to discuss, such as an ecologically sustainable, sustainable population. So is ecological economics appropriate for crisis? Well, I believe it does have the potential to turn around uh, the predicament humanity is in, but I think it has to be careful in regard to pluralism to make sure it actually defines itself clearly, and that is operating within eco ecological limits, and that means we do have to tackle the difficult issues such as population, consumerism, consumption, as well as equity, which of course we need to tackle. The other thing is it should also commit itself to ecological ethics. And in fact, the only uh, of those models that actually talks about 
uh, ecological ethics is, uh, well, I'll come back to that in a second. A uh, steady state economy uh, does define itself clearly, uh, ecologically sustainable population, low level of throughput of resources and greater equity. Uh, so, so we should ask what the ethics is of economics. The, the two terms are not often spoken of together, but they should be. The current ethics of neoclassical economics is basically highly anthropocentric and utilitarian. So the happiness of the human majority is seen as the greatest good. Now, Daly noted that the neoclassical view is that man will surpass all limits and remake creation to suit his subjective preferences, which he considered the root of all value, so that in the end, economics is religion. Uh, now, in For the Common Good by Daly and Cobb, they do actually talk about ethics, which includes non-human nature, the rest of life on earth. And for those who are interested in that, Michelle Maloney and I wrote a paper in 2020 on why ecological, a new ecological economics needs ecological ethics. Uh, so changing worldview and ethics, they are actually really important, and yet not a lot of people will not necessarily go there. A lot of scientists seem to think uh, ethics and worldview don't apply to them when in fact, of course, everybody has their own worldview and their eth own ethics. So we need an ecological ethics, I'm arguing, an ethics of kinship with the rest of life on earth, which is very common in indigenous cultures. Why is this so important? Because we need the deep belief that will actually motivate strong, difficult actions like changing our economy. So, we need a return to the teachings and law of indigenous cultures, and uh, Mary Graham will be talking about that later. So one thing you can do is I work with a number of academics around the world on uh, the uh, ecocentrism statement. It's at the journal, The Ecological Citizen, and you can join Paul Ehrlich, Jane Goodall, David Zizek, uh, Holmes Rolston philosophers, and 1,100 other Earth citizens who have signed it today. So that's at the Earth, uh, so the Ecological Citizen Journal, which is an excellent journal with three articles. So that's something you can do if you want to actually speak out on ethics. A tipping point. We know we've got lots of um, bad tipping points that are happening um, in terms of climate change and species extinction. Uh, Daly, uh, sorry, Ehrlich noted back in 2002 that when the time is right, society can be transformed virtually overnight. So there are thresholds in human behavior when cultural evolution moves rapidly. Often they cannot be predicted. How many people predicted the fall of the USSR and the Berlin Wall? So we can in fact turn things around and break denial. Uh, and I believe we may well be in such a time where we're heading towards uh, a tipping point and what we're doing today is really part of that, I would argue. So moving forward, I'm almost finished. Um, what do we mean? Uh, we need to be clear that ecological economics will operate within ecological limits. And of course, we're way past those. So we have to degrow substantially to those. The economy shouldn't grow by increasing population or use of resources, only by being smarter and innovative should GDP grow. So, uh, uh, it won't grow as fast, but then again, it won't grow by the two most key drivers of environmental crisis and climate change. Uh, the steady state economy accepts, uh, we have to talk about popular consumption as well as equity. That's why I believe it is the clearest uh, aspect of ecological economics and it's not a partial solution. Of course, there's gonna be lots of other strategies needed and we're gonna be talking about some of them today, like one monetary theory. Not going to read this out, just to point out, are there, is there good news? Well, yes, there is good news that things are happening around. This is a mind map from the Cassie Newsafar's book, Positive Steps to a Steady State Economy. And uh, uh, you can look at that, you can get the PDF for free from our website. So, and also there are the two books that we've produced in Cassie New South Wales, Addicted to Growth and positive steps. You can get them as paperback or you can get the PDF for free. And this website will be available, sorry, this PDF, uh, PowerPoint will be available 
on Cassie New South Wales, and I've just added the references to it uh, for those who want to follow up things. So it's been pretty um, quick uh, rundown, but uh, I'm leaving the more detailed discussion uh, to the other speakers. So thank you very much for, for listening. <laughs>